Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to our November 27th Sunday worship service. I'm Terry Carr, and I'll be your worship leader this morning. I have quite a few announcements. The first one is we'd like to say congratulations to Jason Sherman for winning the Turkey of the Year this year. <laughs> and I also would like to take a minute to thank everybody that came to the potluck last week, but most of all, I'd like to thank the ones that helped. I couldn't have done it without Dolores and Linda Bivens and Cindy Byers, and I thank you so much for helping pull it off. And next year will be even better. We had the un unofficial amount of people was 58 people attended last Sunday. <clears throat> the annual toy drive has begun, as you can see. We are collecting toys, games, unwrapped, or gift cards to be given to the Groveport Madison Human Needs. See your insert for more, for more information. The annual Christmas Bazaar is this Saturday from 9 until 3. It's an excellent time to come and do some Christmas shopping. We love all the donations that everybody gives Asbury for the community store. However, we need to have them put on the shelves in room 3, the donation room. Lately, we've been finding things put inside the store, on tables, and on furniture in the narthex. We'd appreciate your help with this matter. Any questions, contact Diana Sexton. Remember, your ideas are needed for the renovation of the meditation garden. Please reach out to Bill Klein or Don O'Dell for your ideas and comments. We currently need $4,115 to complete the fundraising for the phase of the roof repairs. Please mark your donation for roof repair. Thank you in advance for your generosity. All are encouraged to come to Sunday school at 9 a.m. The Mount Sinai class starts at 8.30 and is studying the prophet Habakkuk. <laughs> dinner and a Bible study and following the fruits of the, dinner and Bible study is studying the fruits of the spirit and are invited to attend at 6.30 on Sunday evening. Monday morning Bible study has begun with a study of Nivana and Jonah. All are invited to attend. While the pledges were blessed last week for the next year's, not like that, um, next year's budget, if you're unable to turn yours in, please do so as soon as you possibly can so that the Finance Committee can adjust the 2023 budget. Please check the insert in the bulletin for any additional announcements. Thank you for listening. And today we are going to light the Advent candle. I stand in front of you. Today we light the first candle of Advent, the candle of hope. We put our hope in the one to come, the promised one who comes from God to bring the good news of salvation. Today we hope in the one Lord who will lead us to walk in the light. Our hope is that we will not continue to, to live in dark valleys, but will instead dwell on the mountain of God. For Christ, for ourselves, for all humankind, today we light this candle in hope. On this day filled with hope, we look expectantly into the coming of, the, of Christ.
one of our announcements, and that is there is no choir today. Today's scripture is Romans 13, 11 through 14. I'm sorry, the call to worship first. I always do that. I'm sorry. Let's do the call to worship. <laughs> In this season of waiting, of longing, in our homes, in our lives, in our workplaces. We come seeking God's life. In our churches, in our neighborhoods, and in our brokenness. We still come seeking God's life. Amen. Today's song is 202. People look east. Amen. I'm going to guess you don't really know that song, huh? <laughs> Amen. Let's go to God in prayer. You can be seated, then we'll pray. Let's pray. O God of the day and God of the night, God of darkness and God of light, God of yesterday, today, tomorrow, and forever, as we begin our journey through Lent and another season of birth and the rebirth of our life, our hope, and our salvation. We are reminded today that we must pay attention so that your light might shine through us, unencumbered by our selfish behaviors, attitudes, wants, and desires. For even as good people, we still are human, O oh God. Please open our hearts and minds this morning so your hope might be our hope and your light might be our light, regardless of the day and regardless of the circumstances. Please alert us to your presence in our worship, in our lives, in our work, in our neighborhood, among all friends, so that people might continue to be transformed by the light of Christ. May it shine brightly in our worship today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. I hope you got my email. I sent you that today I'm going to be doing the children's moments, and this is a part that's yours. This is every single Sunday we do something just especially for you. So look at it, okay? Okay. <clears throat> 
Uh, wasn't it nice to have a nice day to think of all the things you were thankful for? And one time I sat down and wrote all the things that I was thankful for, and the list kept getting longer and longer. And so I'm recommending that you guys do that. Get a piece of paper and a pencil and write down all the things that you are thankful for. Include, of course, your family and your friends and your teachers and your coaches. And remember that your church loves you immensely. Right now, you, we have people like Mr. Stan, Miss Fern, me, Miss Natalie, Miss Angie, the pastor, who all care for you. And look at this. Not five, not 10, not 15, but 18 people in this church do all the things they needed to do so they could do children's moments on Sundays. And that's for you, too. Just want you to know that those are the things that are happening. Now, you know that my big thing is music. And when I was in high school, uh, the band director was a graduate of Ohio State. And I got my master's degree there. So we always sort of talked about that. And when he was 100 years old, they asked him to dot the, the I in Ohio. And we all knew that and watched that. So anyway. Um, I want to close with one of my favorite hymns, and I know it in barbershop, so I sang the bass part. So I hope I remember what the melody was. I don't think you know it. Um, thank you, dear Lord, for music to inspire us as we go along. Thank you for bringing us all here together to share in the wonder of beautiful song. Thank you, dear Lord, for friendships to fill us with radiance within. Touch every heart with the magic of harmony. Thank you, our Father, again and again. Thank you, our Father. Amen. Amen. Love you. Thank you, Connie. Now we'll do the scripture reading. It's Romans 13, 11 through 14, adapted from the New Century Version of the Bible. Do this because we live in an important time. It is now time for you to wake up from your sleep because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is almost finished and the day is almost here. So we should stop doing things that belong to darkness and take up the weapons used for fighting in the light. Let us live in a right way, like the people who belong to the day. We should not have wild parties or get drunk. There should be no sexual sins of any kind or fighting or jealousy. <coughs> but clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and forget about satisfying your sinful self. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Oh, oh. Sorry, just lost my mic. Good timing. <laughs> I'm not going to get it. No. Well, that was good timing. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. By the power of your Holy Spirit, O oh God, teach us to live in the light and to be the light in this dark world, that we might project your hope, establish your peace, and share your joy, that we might point others to the baby Jesus who brings unconditional, unconventional love into our world. May it be your word and your will that is shared in this space and received by us today. Amen. 
To begin with, if you don't know this, let me share something. It's my opinion, but I think you might agree. Romans 13 as a passage is an odd, difficult, but compelling passage of Scripture. And it's not terribly long. It's just 14 verses, but it's an odd piece of Scripture. For example, you have to consider verse 11 starts in the middle. We do this. We'll do what? You have to go back and see what what is, right? So if you look at the first seven or so verses, it's all about obeying the law and not Old Testament law, but the government, the law of the land. In those verses, which are controversial because there's so many different translations, we read words like this. All of you must yield to the government rulers because no one rules unless God has given them the power to rule. And no one rules without that power from God. That's from Romans. And then it says this. Those who are against the government are really against what God has commanded. And those who do right do not have to fear the rulers. Now, I'm reading Romans. I didn't write that, so don't get mad at me. But that's why I started with Romans is an odd, difficult, and compelling passage. Now, to be clear, the verses um, are still very much debated even today. And I want to read some commentary on those verses because they have to do with what is this do this that we're talking about. And this comes from the Life Application Bible Commentary. I think it's clear, although not succinct, but I think it's worth hearing. It says, Christians understand Romans 13 in different ways. All Christians agree that we are to live at peace with the state as long as the state allows us to live by our religious convictions. For hundreds of years, however, there have been at least three interpretations of how we're supposed to do that. Some Christians believe that the state is so corrupt that Christians should have as little to do with it as possible. Although we believe that we should be good Christians, as long as we can do that without compromising our beliefs, we should not work for the government, vote in elections, or serve in the military. That's one interpretation of what that scripture means. There are other believers who think that God has given the state authority in certain areas and the church authority in certain areas. They believe Christians are to be loyal to both and work for either. They should not, however, confuse the two. Now, in this view, the church and state are concerned with two separately different spheres, the spiritual and the physical. And thus, they complement each, each other, but they do not work together. Still others believe that Christians have a responsibility to make the state better. This is the third view. They can also do this morally by serving as an influence for good in society. In this view, the church and state ideally work together for the good of all. None of these ties, I'm sorry, none of these views advocate rebelling against or refusing to obey the government's laws or regulations unless those laws clearly require you to violate the moral standards revealed by God. I'm still quoting, by the way. It says, whenever you, um, wherever, whenever we find, where, oh my gosh, I can't read now. Wherever we find ourselves, we must be reasonable citizens as well as responsible Christians. So those are three different Christian views of what is being told for us to do in this chapter. But the verses say that we obey the government. We pay our taxes and we do not owe anyone. That's in Romans. Well, then it comes on. It says, so hear that. We obey the government, pay our taxes, and don't owe anyone. And then it comes right back and corrects that. And it says, well, don't owe anyone anything except love. And then it goes into some stuff that sounds kind of familiar. It says, don't. Uh, do not owe people anything except always love to each other because the person who loves others has obeyed the law. Boom. Just like that, the author moves us from obeying the law of the land or the government to obeying the law of God. They're being pushed together. 
except or don't owe anyone anything and pay your taxes, except always owe love to each other because the person who loves others has obeyed the law of God. We're shifting what our obedience means. It's connecting them. And then what does it say? It goes on to verse 10, 9 and 10. <coughs> Sorry. It says, you must not be guilty of adultery, of murder. You must not steal and you must not be jealous of your neighbor. What must you do? Love your neighbor as yourself. What does that mean? That sounds familiar. Then it says to clarify, verse 10, Love never hurts a neighbor, so loving is obeying all the law. Wow, that's kind of a lot in a few verses, isn't it? So we have to obey all of God's law and all of man's laws, or the government, unless the government is specifically requiring you as the individual to break the law. That's what, that's what it's talking about. So why do we care about this? Well, because it says we do this, that's what verse 11 is talking about. We do this because we live in an important time. That's where our scripture started. We do what? We obey the law of the land. We obey the law of the Lord. We love our neighbor. We don't hurt our neighbor. But we also follow all the law of God it's talking about now. We don't, and then there's a smattering of what comes out of the law. There's things pulled out. We don't, for example, commit adultery. We don't kill people. We don't steal. We're not jealous of one another because none of us would do that anyway. We don't owe anybody anything except love. That's what we do. And why do we do it? Because salvation is closer than when we first believe. The night is almost finished and the day is almost here. The night is almost finished. Now, what in the, is that code? It's not really code, but know this. In the ancient world, which include, included the Jews, the Romans, and the Greeks, everybody associated good with light and daytime and bad with evil and darkness and night. So believers were encouraged to embrace and live out the values that belong to the day, that belong to the light, and they avoid the darkness and anything associated with the nighttime. And in the context of our scriptures, they avoid the things of the world because that is the night, that is the darkness, and they seek after the things of the light, which is the way of God as Jesus comes to teach us. The other thing is the reference to night and day also refers to the end of the darkness, the end of the world as we know it, and the return of day, the return of Christ, and the ultimate and eternal manifestation of the kingdom of God as God intended things always to be. So the night is almost gone, and the day is almost here. I think that in some ways, we are familiar with the ideas of dark and light, of day and night. But think about the implications in the words that are written on the page. They're talking about all life. They're talking about the end of the world as we know it and the coming of the kingdom of God. And then they're saying as a reminder, the night is gone and the day is almost here. The time of our salvation is closer than when we believed. What is this really talking about? What is this really all about? The present world is going to pass away at some point. We don't know when. But Christ came to prepare us for his ultimate return. So we are supposed to be living in the light every day as much as possible, regardless of what else is going on, because first, we don't know when the day is going to arrive. But secondly, Christ is concerned with us being clean on the inside as well as the outside. Being clean on the inside is following God's law, but being clean on the outside is being clean in the world that we find ourselves in. That's why you follow the law unless the law calls you to do something against God. That's why you present yourself as a good citizen because that's living in the light and making a difference in the dark world. Salvation is nearer now than we first believed, than when we first believed. 
Well, that's absolutely true, isn't it? Salvation is nearer than when we first believed. There are some truths that we don't necessarily say them out loud that often, but they're obvious. For example, today is the oldest I've ever been in my life. And I'm pretty sure today is the oldest you've ever been in your life. And the other truth, whether you see it as good or bad, is that every day we are one day closer to our death than we were the day before. Those are truths. It is true that salvation is closer than it was the day we first believed. We don't know when it's going to happen, but we know it's closer, right? Because time has passed. As I, when I was a kid, you know what they would say to that? Well, duh. Obviously, salvation is closer than when we first believed. But the key question is not how close is it, but how ready are we for it? Are we living in the light, or do we proclaim truths of light while we still hide in the darkness? Because it matters. So what does this really mean? Again, Jesus wants us to be clean on the inside and the outside. But how do we do that? We focus on being the light, on following the law of God and following the law of our land. Notice that doing that, making sure that I am clean on the inside and the outside, doesn't have anything to do with looking at somebody else and their sin and telling them how to live out their faith. In fact, what does it really say? It's the opposite. I need to look at myself. I need to look at how I live. I need to consider, am I the light at all times? When are those times when my living actually looks like I'm living in the dark, like I'm living in the world, like I'm living in the night? It says we need to stop doing things that belong to darkness and take up the weapons used for fighting in the light. But what does that mean? Well, again, it means obeying the laws of God and the laws of the land to the best of our ability, to the best of our understanding. Now, do we do that all day, every day? Don't say out loud, just think about it. Are there times when our behavior slips away from the model that Jesus gives us because the situation in front of us or the person in front of us calls for a behavior that might not be Christ-like? We do it all the time if we tell the truth, but are we paying attention to how often we step into the dark? How often do we exit the light to do what we have to do, to take care of ourselves, to take care of business? And then we wander back in the light and take on those Christian words like we've not done anything wrong. And then when the time comes to confess it, we forget to lay it on God's altar. It's really not that easy. It may be easy not to break the government's laws, but notice what Paul or the writer, we presume it Paul, but whoever wrote the letter, there are things, he's just picked a smattering of stuff from the law. And he mixed up the easy stuff and the hard stuff. Did you notice that? That's a short list, and he still picked easy and hard. For most of us, it's easy not to commit adultery. For most of us, it's easy not to kill someone or to steal. But jealousy? Have you noticed how quick jealousy can flare up sometimes? And guess what? Pastors struggle with it, too, because we're human. All of us struggle with it. What are picked are easy things to avoid and the things that plague us every day. Because most of us, most of us, we're talking numbers now, most of us aren't darkness in the world because we killed somebody. But how many of us present as darkness in the world because we're jealous? Because it usually doesn't stop with jealousy, does it? It leads to other dark behaviors unless we check ourselves and go back to living as Jesus taught. The easiest summary is what? Don't hurt your neighbor. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Except guess what's not defined? Two big things. Who's your neighbor and what constitutes hurt? That's a huge statement. Don't hurt your neighbor. Who can raise your hand and say, never in my life have I ever hurt a neighbor? Well, guess what? That means we all have work to do. That was an example. My hand is not up. <laughs> that means we have work to do. 
Because when Jesus returns, he wants to find us, his church, his peeps. He wants to find us clean on the inside and the outside. Most of us are probably pretty clean on the outside. It's the inside that can do you some work. And again, it might feel good to look at the other person who's a bigger sinner than I am and say, but look, look how bad he is. Look how bad she is. But that doesn't help me get clean on the inside, does it? And in the church in particular, we are really good at focusing on other people's sins. And we're really good at trying to control how they behave based on their interpretations of Scripture. And I don't see where we're called to do that. We're called to mind our own sins, to mind our own business, to do our best to be like Christ, to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, to not hurt our neighbor. I don't know about you, but I think that can keep us pretty busy all the time. So if we focus on our sins and controlling our behaviors and our attitudes so that we are clear that we resemble the daytime and the holy light of Christ all day, every day, in every situation, with every person that we encounter, think about what a difference the church could really make. Because what if that, and only that, was each one of our focus all day long to be the holy light of Christ all day, every day, in every situation with every person we encounter? That's a pretty big task. And that's something that we all have to do together if the church is gonna make a difference. We have to be the light in the dark world, because where else is it going to come from? Just like Christ came that one Christmas night as a light glowing in the dark world, one day the church, I believe, will become exactly what we're supposed to be, a light birthed in the darkness of the world that continues to glow and bring the warmth, the love, the power, the salvation that comes through the Holy Spirit because of Christ, that baby born into the world. When we become less concerned about who and how people come to the light and how they believe God is calling them to live in the light, and we're more concerned with being the light rather than controlling upon whom the light shines, we will be ready for the day, for the return of Christ and the joyful reunion of Christ with Christ's church, with every person in the world. That's what our goal should be, that when Christ returns, his church would be every person in the world. That should be our goal. That should be our hope. That should be our prayer. That should be our mission. And when we focus on that, it does become easy to relinquish our selfish, sinful, personal desires, to relinquish our quest for power and authority. If we devote ourselves wholeheartedly to living, loving, and serving like Christ all day long, Whether we understand why that other person needs our compassion or not, we truly can be the light shining in the darkness of every day. And that is how we introduce broken souls to the life-forming, life-transforming, life-redeeming love of Jesus Christ. That's how we grow the church. It's not by fancy music or fancy sermons or fancy anything. It is about consistently being the light, serving Jesus, loving people that are not lovable because Jesus loves people that aren't lovable. And that's what we're called to do. And if we focus on that and let the other stuff be less important, leave the other stuff to God is what I'm saying, and focus on being the light, not judging, not hurting, but loving, understanding, seeing other people, whether you understand them or not. The first step is to see people and acknowledge that they're people, whether their politics are the same, whether their theology is the same, whether their lifestyle is the same. We can be the light by being like Jesus, the light that came into the world. Look at the world around us and all the broken people in it. 
What more will it take for us, the church, to focus on being the church and let everything else go? It's time for us to wake up from our sleep because our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is almost finished and the day is almost here. So we need to stop doing the things that belong to the darkness, even if we convince ourselves they belong to the light or that the church should be doing it for the betterment of other people. We need to let go of the things that belong to the night and embrace the light, which is living like Jesus. And that will keep us busy. In this season of Advent, let us lay aside our illusions and our nighttime behaviors and pick up the mantle that Jesus brings with him when he comes into the world. The night is almost finished and the day really is almost here and someone needs to see the light of Bethlehem in you just like someone needs to see the light of Bethlehem in me. Whenever they look at me, wherever I am, whatever I'm doing, think about light. I want you to indulge me this last thing before I close. Close your eyes and picture the light of Christ that drew you to Christ. Think about what or who was the embodiment of the light of Christ that first drew you to Christ. And then open your eyes and go out and be that light for somebody else. Because somebody else needs you to be that light. The night is almost over and the day is almost here. So go out with everything you have. Let the light of Christ shine in you that others might see and believe. You are the light in the dark world. Go out and shine that others might see Christ in you. So let it be spoken, so let it be lived in the name of Jesus, amen. It is because of the baby Jesus that we are able to go to God in prayer, to bring to God the things that trouble us and to bring to God our praises for the joys that we have um, experienced in our lives, in the week, we've just come through Thanksgiving, so I'm hoping that all of us had a time of thanking God for a lifetime or at least a year's worth of blessings. Let us prepare to go to God again today. Today we pray for Marsha Gavorshik, who has ongoing health concerns. We want to keep her in our prayer. Today we pray for the family of Fred Sisson, who passed away unexpectedly this week. Um, Fred was Angie Rogers' brother-in-law. We pray for Oscar Bickert Sr., who is now in ICU at Mount Carmel East with COVID and with some other uh, health issues, so we really need to pray for him. We pray for Jackson Glenn, he is the nine-year-old grandson of Debbie Glenn. He was tangled up in the lead strap of his 1,000-pound steer and was drug underneath it for 100 yards. Um, he has traumatic brain injury and internal injuries, so we want to remember Jackson and as well as Debbie and the rest of the family. Um, we also want to pray for the family of Kristen Davis. In November, she turned, I think it was 33, but she's very young or was very young. She grew up somewhere in this area. The family told me where, but you know, I, I don't know where, but in this area. And we're going to celebrate her life here at the church on Tuesday evening. So just keep the Davis family in your prayers. Her death was unexpected and she was very young. We want to pray for Nova Harris's friends, um, Bryce and Eric. And Eric has COVID pneumonia. Is that right? Um, we want to pray for Luann Hallstrom's sister, Linda Saunders, who is in treatment for, I think it was follicular cancer, or lymphoma, sorry, follicular lymphoma, and she has been in remission for 12 years, but she is now in treatment for follicular lymphoma. Um, we want to remember Deb Schnitke, who is out sick today, um, but we want to lift up some praises before we go to God in prayer. But we say thank you, God, for the blessing of the holiday. Um, the Thanksgiving holiday, and we want to remember 
that this year was very different from Thanksgiving a year ago and Thanksgiving two years ago. And so for that, we must be grateful. Um, we want to say thanks be to God that Becky Souls' granddaughter had a three and a half pound baby boy in Tennessee on Friday. Um, that was November 19th. We want to say uh, continued prayers for strength for uh, the baby as he gets stronger and stronger and as well as the family. But thanks be to God for that safe delivery and he is doing better. So we say thanks be to God for that. Um, and on a personal note, I want to say thank you to Tim Baumgartner, Lou Casperson, and Oscar Bickert Jr. They delivered and installed a new refrigerator at the Parsonage on Monday, so before Thanksgiving. Um, and also a special thank you to the Friday Morning Cafe. I didn't ask for permission, so sorry if I'm not supposed to say this, but they made it possible by buying the refrigerator on behalf of the church. So thank you, and God bless you. It's nice to have a refrigerator that I don't have to duct tape closed. So thanks be to God for that. Well, it was that or let it stay open. So thanks be to God for that. Those are the blessings that sometimes if you don't say them, people don't know hard work goes into blessing people. So I am grateful, and I just wanted to share that with you because I would have called on somebody here if they hadn't helped. So thanks be to God. So let us go to God in prayer now. God, we acknowledge that the quote-unquote official Thanksgiving holiday is behind us. But we hope to never be finished saying thank you to you because we claim your promises to always bless us and care for us. We pray that you would never allow us to become entitled or ungrateful. May we never take for granted the privilege of bringing our prayers and our praises to you, O oh God, for it is by your death, your resurrection, that we have the privilege to do that. God, you already know the names and the circumstances of the people that we lift before you now, but in our own voices, we have shared their names, and in faith, we place them upon your altar in your care. You see beyond our ability to see and, be, and love beyond our capability of loving. For that, we are grateful. We pray now that all that we have prayed for and all of us too will see you in our situations and as we pray for their faith to carry them through, I pray also for our faith to carry us through whatever we may face because we don't know what is ahead in the hour, in the day, in the week, in our lives. All we know is that the night is short and day it's on his way. This Advent and this Christmas, may we live and love in such a way that people confuse us for the man with the that the baby will grow into. May people encounter Christ through us, through our prayers, through our praise, through our gifts, through our service to this neighborhood, to this community, to this city and this world. In all things, we are grateful. In all things, we trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please join me now as we pray together the Lord's Prayer for this first time in Advent. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I invite our ushers to please prepare to come forward to collect our tithes and offerings. Let us come with gratitude and joy to the presence of the Lord, bringing the works of our hands and the gifts of our service in our lives. Let us prepare to make our offering to the God of our hope and salvation. Ushers, please come.
God of grace and God of hope, as we present our gifts to you, we bring both our earthly treasures and the gifts of our service of our lives. We have life because of the gift of the coming Christ child. So we ask that you transform us through our giving and through the gifts of this offering. May we help lead others to Christ. May the baby who changed our lives inspire us and others to live in the day like Jesus. Amen. Page 196, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus.
Because we belong to the day, we must live decent lives for all to see, and we should clothe ourselves with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. We should pray, study, praise, and emulate Christ with our words, our attitudes, our behaviors, so that the light of Christ is our constant companion, and we become the conveyors of his light in this dark world. As Christ came to bring light to the world, let us depart worship, taking Christ's light into the world with us. In all we do, for all to see that they might be drawn to Jesus by the Christ's power bearing his light. Let us go forth to serve. Let us go forth to love. Let us go forth and be the church. Amen.